women matters at the end of August 22. Talking probably about boundaries today, but we will see how it goes. First, like always, the weather forecast from Vienna by Monia. <laughs> well, we have nice weather. It's not too hot. Um, nevertheless, when you have to get outside and carry something, it's still damp. But it's much nicer than two weeks ago, which was just terrible. And uh, so there is rain, but just very local. And yeah, there isn't much I can tell you about. There's not much happening, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's comfortable and nice where I am. And I give on to or pass on to Beatrice. Well, I'm still in New York. Um, last time I had just arrived, so it's now official exactly <laughs> two weeks later um it's been very busy my mother was here for a few days um while he's here the first week here i was working on a theater project which was very fun um and i got to see some live jazz music and i got to catch up with some friends and i've been going out to a lot of social dances uh blues and fusion dancing mostly um and I still haven't started working on the things that I came here to work for, <laughs> which are gonna be two performances early September. Um, uh, but I, these other projects have been showing up. And uh, just last week, I, an old mentor of mine posted on Facebook, she shared her friend's post asked, uh, for a call for dancers for a project. And I just decided why not, you know, I've. I haven't, I've never, I've actually never auditioned for something live in New York. I did one online audition last year, um, but otherwise I was in grad school and I was doing my own projects. And um, so this was my first time going out into the world and auditioning for somebody that I didn't know. Um, and so I auditioned on Friday and then on Saturday, I got the email that I got a part. So that was very exciting. <laughs> Um, and it's it's a paid it's a paid dance um, engagement. There's two weeks of rehearsal, and then there's going to be two or three performances um, at the, towards the end of September. So um, very excited about that. And um, I don't know, it makes me feel <laughs> it makes me feel like I actually know what I'm doing, <laughs> which is a nice nice feeling. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. I just woke up. I haven't been getting a lot of sleep. I've been very busy, and I need to be better about that um yeah so I guess I'm staying here for more than a month I still haven't bought my, bought my return ticket so we'll see what happens um depending on the the generosity of friends um for places to stay and we'll see we'll see where things go so that's my check-in I'll pass I'll pass to the other Martino in the room <laughs> Um, <clears throat> well, I didn't just wake up, but, um, but I'm feeling very tired. Um, I'm, I, I guess I'm incredibly stressed out. I had the most blood curdling nightmares last night I've had in recent history. Um, and it's ironic because I had three nights of really nice sleep and with very pleasant, interesting dreams that seemed to have nothing to do with anything. It was just like going to the cinema. And um, I felt really energized and happy. And um, and then last night, all hell broke loose. And so I'm a little, <laughs> a little disoriented. Um, I think it's because I realized yesterday, I mean, for the millionth time, but more intensely that this upcoming concert I have of the complete works of Stravinsky um, on September 16th is, it, it'll, take everything in my mind, body, spirit, and soul <laughs> and environment to um, just to get through it, let alone to make it a really good concert. So I think that's what the nightmare was about in short, because it was just, I mean, it was a lot of, you know, 
crazy stuff, which I won't get into. So that's the um, the unfortunate truth. Otherwise, um, it was really, it was fun to be in New York, but very stressful. Um, Beatrice was in transition and talking about boundaries. I felt as a mother um, kind of weighed down because I was concerned about her because she's she had a lot of um, gestalt of wut. Oh, oh, this isn't the German group. So <laughs> also, we need to explain that even to the Germans. That's true. Um, so it was it was a nice trip, but it was it was very stressful. Um, and I was I, maybe for the first time coming back from New York because I love New York so much. Um, I was really happy to get home and um, and just just swim in my pool and and, you know, practice in my own house, although it was nice to practice in an air conditioned room, hotel room, um, and just see the ocean. And I don't know. So, so I, so that was a blessing to, to sort of reacquaint myself with the fact that I'm in a really blessed place. I mean, that I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to be, to live here. Um, so I'm really, it was, it was kind of funny because as soon as we left, um, Beatrice did her audition and got the part and and it was like you know Mr. Hyde turning back into Dr. Jekyll <laughs> so so um so I'm really happy for her um but it's it's kind of funny too and um anyway enough of all of that I'm um I'm looking forward to the topic and um I'm so glad to see you again Christine and um I'm already making plans which I hope you will agree to to go to um my very favorite ice cream place which now has a bakery too um we were there the other day with cousins and um and it's in Encinitas so it's close to you so I hope we can have a a date and and meet in, in real life um so yeah did you didn't check in right so I'm I'm passing to you with the lure of the ice cream and cake <laughs> and cake wow okay sounds good Sounds good. Um, but uh, Victoria, have you asked your physician about the nightmares? Have you, I mean. Oh I yeah, it's, it's, it's an ongoing topic, but it's, it's yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, the one thing I haven't done that, that, that allegedly I'm supposed to be doing is writing everything down. I'm still resisting and everyone keeps insisting that's the, that's the key to the whole solution is to write everything down and then I can then I'm free to change the plot and reconstruct the dream and um you know gain control over all these images and um I can see Monia agrees um determine the symbolism of everything and and um, put these things to rest so um yeah so laziness maybe is at the source of all of this but that's a different topic entirely. But thank you. Anyway, please check in. Um, I had a lovely weekend. My uh, friend of over 40 years came and visited. We uh, Once a year, she comes to see me and I go up uh, Northern California to see her. So this was her turn to come down. Um, it was, it started off rough because she missed her plane on Friday night. She missed her plane, and so she arrived four hours later than she was supposed to. Um, she got caught in traffic. She didn't check her her app to see how the traffic was. And then when she got to the airport, she realized she had left her suitcase in the driveway, <laughs> which is like we're laughing about it. But, you know, uh, it's a serious problem when you're forgetting things like this. You know, we're all making these kinds of unbelievable mistakes. So uh, anyway, it was a lovely weekend. Uh, it's always good to spend time with her. We feels like a sister. And uh, so, you know, kind of on Monday, I'm feeling a little bit of that angst of the separation and having the nice weekend end and, and all of that. But um, I think I mentioned two weeks ago that our younger daughter, Alexis, moved back home and so we've got piles of her things, mostly in her end of the house. So that's not too bad. She, she's got two rooms that she can clutter up and she's got a lot of stuff. I don't know what she's gonna do with it all because she had been in a studio apartment 
and now she's back in living in a bedroom. So I don't know what's going to happen to it all. Um, but the boundary issue is significant. I think I mentioned last time, I'm just going to try to make sure I don't, I don't want to be back in the mom role. Um, so I don't want her asking me a lot of questions to get my permission or advice or opinion. And I don't want to be asking her uh, to get information. So I just want us to be able to you know, reasonably coexist without having to return to that mother uh, daughter role very often. So yeah, and that's been going okay. Um, it's hard to turn the mother thing off, that's for sure. So um, anything else? Not really. Okay, so I take over with the check-in and then we go back to the boundary thing. Um, I had a, a person here and it was very nice. We worked three days, uh, almost full time on the project to create a community here. And she, the last day from morning to evening, we did constellation work and it was really, really great. And it's moving now in inside of me you know it's it, it's it came clearer what the project might be in which direction and so on and she offered to do some sort of flyer out of what she has heard what she has <laughs> learned and then we try to find the right people for that because so far i just looked for people and some people came but they were not the right ones so maybe when the project is um described a little bit better and also for me clearer then hopefully we find the right people so that was very um, dominant in the last week then I already told Monia I have a new little doggy uh, uh, let's say almost uh, she looks like a daughter of mine she, she is black like her she's four months old and that's going quite well uh, amazingly well so she had eaten the shoe of somebody in the first house where she was born you know and they brought <laughs> me this shoe but she hardly ever looks at it the first night she took away one of my shoes but she didn't eat it just to put it on the sofa and she's even listening to her name and coming and so it's just I'm intrigued by this little little girl <laughs> Yeah, that's the news in, in my life. Relationship and um, with animals. And that's also a boundary issue, you know, how much do you do? How little do you do? How much do you allow them to do with you and things like that? That's, uh, yeah. And then in the future, boundary issue will certainly be with people who then finally will, I will find to create this sort of community here yeah. we will see is she there with you right now who cool. your dog um the big one is here where's the little one mia is her name mia is her name i think she's outside she okay. is she okay. is taken over the the role of the guardian also she is only four months old but when there is something she immediately you know well, my dog, it's not really. I always thought when a burglar is coming, she will bring in, uh, helping them to carry away the stuff because she is so, so nice to everybody, to all humans. Well, the new one, she is quite, you know, good. I'm, I'm happy for that. She has, her father was a shepherd, a German shepherd, so she might have earned uh, or how do you say not earned it might have got some of this instinct of of um, protection you know so mm -hmm. good so now we go ahead with the boundaries and let's see let's see what is coming out of it who wants to start well maybe christine can give us yeah, and also uh, Beatrice and uh, Victoria, how did you manage the boundary when you, do you manage it when you are together? 
in one place or the other. So you two are in, I mean, you three, you are in, uh, in the start. <laughs> well, I was thinking that, um... I guess it's a different dynamic. If one person is just trying to establish a boundary for themselves, you know, it, it can be a protective thing, you know, to make sure people don't intrude or don't get too enmeshed. So it can be protective. Um, and also trying to be maybe assertive and just kind of establish your own space, right? Um, but when there's two people, uh, like office mates or two family members or colleagues or, or whatever, then the boundary, you know, is kind of mutual. And it's more, I think about maybe, maybe it's always about roles, but often when two people are both trying to establish a boundary together, then there's, you know, has to be some kind of understanding about what are the roles that we're trying to establish here. Um, R-O-L-E-S, not R-U-L-E-S, but they both apply, I guess. Um, so I don't know, I think uh, when I think of my, ah, cute, really cute, ah, big, big for four months. Um, so when I think of my daughter moving back in, I'm thinking primarily about my own boundaries of, you know, what, what do I want to establish so that I am not feeling overextended, so that I'm not feeling like I've got a new job to tackle uh, by looking after her or, you know, being concerned about her in ways that I didn't have to be and she probably doesn't want me to be. So, um, yeah, she and I haven't talked too much about mutual boundaries. Um, but you know what I think I need to do is maybe invite her to let me know if I've crossed her boundary. Um, I haven't asked her that question, but as I'm talking, I'm thinking maybe that's a good idea. Uh, I should probably check in with her and, and find out, you know, can you let me know if you feel like I've overstepped something? So anyway, that's what comes to mind off the top of my head. I have a question. How is it when you feel sort of impacted by the presence of the other person while you have found your own rhythm and your own way of being in your house and now there's somebody else? How do you create the boundary there for yourself? How do, do you talk or how, how would you do that? When, you know, also the daughter, she knows uh, how the kitchen is and, and how she was as a child and she would come in probably everywhere and, you know, which is understandable. But how, how do you do that? Um, well, fortunately, yeah, fortunately, she's um, pretty considerate. So she's always looking to kind of not be intrusive also. And she's helpful. She does stuff that I don't ask her to do, but she just see something that needs to be done. So that's nice. I mean, she's kind of doing that herself. But I think for me, I have to stop and say, why am I, why am I thinking about this? Why am I wanting to get involved and find out if it's coming from a place that's healthy or helpful? Um, or if I'm really just, again, kind of crossing the boundary that I don't need to be involved in. So it's more on a, uh, do I really need to be doing this? Because I find it distracting. You know, I think the biggest or maybe one of the biggest downsides for me is an extra distraction in my everyday life. Um, and I'm aware that when I get distracted from doing things, I'm less efficient, less productive, more forgetful, make more mistakes because I'm trying to go in in too many different directions and I can't multitask as, as well <laughs> as I used to. So I've really got to make sure things don't kind of come into my awareness or consciousness and take me off into a, a territory that I wasn't intending to go because then I, I, again, I lose efficiency or just I don't complete what I was attempting to complete. Um, so for me, it's a lot of making sure I don't get distracted and, and taken off track. And I don't want to be um, a busybody in terms of her life. 
Uh, but she does pose questions <laughs> to me and Tom uh, about what her choices and whatnot. But I don't know, we probably, being psychologists, we also have to make sure that we keep our boundaries and don't ask her questions or probe just because we're psychologists and curious and have this need to know. But I think uh, if she wants to talk to somebody about that stuff, she's got to figure that out or do that on her own. That's that's a hard boundary, you know. To give you a timeline, how long she plans to stay? No. So this was about going to graduate school and saving money. So, you know, this is not a short-term thing, really. But no, we haven't talked about that. She's paying rent. We told her she's going to be paying rent. So okay. we've established that. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, a total free ride. Um, yeah, she's paying a little bit of rent and then she's expected to pay, you know, some of her own food expenses and that kind of thing. I was also wondering because the first thing you mentioned was your role as a mother. And I just read, I don't know where, but I read that women in a relationship with a with your man, uh, are, it, it sort of goes down and when the children leave the house again, it goes up again. So maybe uh, this is really something to keep in the back of the mind, what it is doing to your relationship to your husband. So this is, uh, yeah, because I notice it when our children come to visit, um, yeah, it's, it's not either we, the two of two talk together, she and I, or my husband and, and uh, she or her and uh, her partner. But when we sit together as uh, four, I always keep myself back. I noticed that. And it's, um, yeah, I don't know why I do it, but it's actually because so many are talking and it's, it's but I, I guess it's uh, just a short dip into what it was like before they left home. Mm -hmm. And yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. So how is it for, for, for you both? The boundaries, are you clear what your boundaries are? And uh, does your mother sometimes play too much still the role of mother? Or you too much the role of daughter, or how is it? Uh, it's the other way around. Um, <laughs> a, 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 two friends of mine in New York um, remarked on the fact because because we all got together, you know, as groups the, during the visit because um, I had so little time. Um, two different people remarked on how um, Beatrice seemed to be my mother that just that watching our interactions. So <laughs> it was interesting. Um, they thought she was trying to keep me in line and, and straightened out and um, on the straight and narrow, um, which was something that uh, that some of the, one of our grief therapists um, talked about after, after Conrad, um, Beatrice's father, my husband um, died that, well, well, what she said, which was interesting, and it was true, was it was it was like it, every week when we went to see the therapist, it was a different dynamic. It was, you know, I was the mother, Beatrice was the child, then it reversed, it flipped, then we were best friends, then we were like deadly enemies, <laughs> then we were, um, you know, kind of like colleagues. And uh, anyway, so so it's it's been actually, I think, very maybe it's a good thing because it seems to me that that the good thing about it is that there's a dynamic because I have other friends who um who are totally Certainly dynamic <laughs> <laughs> Bye. all right we don't have to silence yourself yeah go ahead go ahead and say go what for it go for it <laughs> no no I, I just wanted to <laughs> chime in and say that no, I think I, well, I, all I wanted to say to finish that thought was that um, I, m most of my friends um, who have who have children stay stay in that relationship. Like um, we were just um, Beatrice and I. Well, I have this um, 
well, he's he's Beatrice's oldest, I mean, longest standing friend um, from uh, childhood. And his mother um, and father still treat him, well, they, they have a problem anyway, because they treat him like God, basically. They're like Mary and Joseph with the baby Jesus. <laughs> and he's now, tw- how old is David now? 28. 28, yeah. He still lives at home. He went away to college and did really well, um, but then went straight home and hasn't left since. And um, he he thinks he's very helpful. And in some ways he is, but basically, especially with his mother, um, you know, she treats him still like, a you know, an adorable, sweet, cuddly baby. And, um, and then his father treats him like a kind of God. So um, it seems to work for them all because when he was away at college, well, I think the, I think his mother was very realistic. You know, I think she missed him, but she was, she worked so hard. I don't think it was a big deal. The father who doesn't work, um, and they're both musicians, the, the son and the father, um, just almost died from the grief of missing his son. So anyway, but that's off topic. Um, it's just that Beatrice and I were thinking about this family because we know them so intimately in terms of like watching how the boundaries work in a in a relationship that kind of seems in a strange way to be static, like like everyone gets older, but the the dynamic is the same the the power well, it was not a power thing in that case um so it's yeah so you speak Beatrice I don't I don't know what I'm talking about I'm gonna drink my coffee <laughs> well make a to, here. to make another to make another example of of I mean it is interesting we seem to have some kind of a unique relationship because I have the the opposite reaction from people when I talk about how much we're hanging out or how much we're doing together or when you were in town. I I had tentatively made some other plans and I rescheduled or canceled a lot of them so that we could hang out and and then kind of got this surprised reaction of you know boy you're really close with your family aren't you <laughs> you know I could never spend that much time with my family you know, that that's usually the reaction I get of of how much we actually do together and even if it's dynamic and volatile and can be emotional we were very attached to each other in a way that feels normal to me because it's what I'm used to but but as I've as I've as other people in my life have now started to observe from the outside what our family is like I realize it's actually quite abnormal (laughs) Um, so, I mean, even, even the fact that when we're together, we eat all our meals together, which that might be it. That might be a, you know, I, I don't know if, if maybe that's more a European thing or more a certain generation or, or certain way of growing up. I don't know, but, but most of the people that I know my age, um, come from families and traditions where like they may occasionally have a meal together that isn't established. We're sitting down and having dinner together, you know, like a weekly family dinner or something like that, but that's it. And otherwise people just kind of fend for themselves and you happen to sit down and eat together if you feel like it, but it's, and our family breakfast, lunch, dinner, you sit down, you light the candle, we sing a little prayer, we eat our meal. We often sit at the table a long time after to keep talking and and just every single meal there's no and there's not really any snacking or foraging or anything happening in the middle you know we have our meal times and they happen together I mean this is when we're in the same space um so I'm also used to that so when I go visit like right now I'm you know I'm staying with someone and I I it's it's been strange when I've stayed or lived with other people because I kind of expect that. And I, when I, I want to interfere because when I came first to, to see my sister in America, I found out she tried to do the thing, but I saw that the Americans are not used to eat it together. They just go to the fridge and get something. And I think it's really a European habit, isn't it, Monia? I enjoyed it because that's the only time in my family where we were together and really could talk about things. 
and I still, when there are guests here or family, or I cook and I love to, you know, to to be together with people. So for for, for the meals. So well, my mother, um, my mother always said she loved it when I came to visit because I would um, clear off all her bills and paperwork and pens and pencils and phone books and stuff on the dining room table. And I would put down a tablecloth and candles and flowers. I'd go out to the garden and um, and insist that my mother sit down and not be jumping around in the kitchen all the time. And she, I said, oh, I love this so much. But she did. She never actually implemented it in her own life. And when my dad died, she said that she didn't grieve as much as she thought she would because she always assumed he was down in the computer room. She was so used to eating her own meals. <laughs> <laughs> she thought, oh, he'll come up sooner or later. And and then, you know, then she'd forget about him and he didn't come up because of course he was dead. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it showed that she appreciated that. But um, so we didn't have the tradition in our family, but, um, but Conrad and I um, totally had that tradition. And, um, and, and with Beatrice, that even at the crack of dawn, we were all eating breakfast together. And, um, and so I was, I was so shocked, apropos of your dog, Heidi, <laughs> that when Conrad died, everyone was telling me, oh, you know, you were so close to your husband and you were inseparable, you know, you did everything together, um, which we did. Um, you really need to get a dog. And, and it struck me as almost hilarious when people said, I mean, I was actually really angry at the time. Now it sounds hilarious. Um, because what I missed most when he died were these, these endless, like we'd sit down for breakfast and then have a conversation and realize it was lunchtime. So then we just get up and make lunch and sit down again <laughs> and talk. And, um, you can't do that with a dog, you know, you can do a lot of things with a dog. <laughs> so I think the, um, yeah, that, that kind of, that, that maybe is something you know, unique to our family, except I think that, yeah, I think that otherwise the European, um, the kind of formality or whatever, the ritual is something that's much more European than um, American. And the Japanese are even worse. They never even see each other. Mm. Everyone has different schedules and 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 the whole society is falling apart. Um, I mean, I've seen, I've seen documentaries on it, how the whole Japanese society is, is crumbling because even though they live intergenerally, generationally, um, the, you know, the grandparents, they're all in the same building and house apartment, but they never connect because everyone is on their own schedule. So there's no relationship. Everyone's isolated and um, it's destroying the sort of the whole fabric of the family. So keep it up in Europe. Yeah, I, I grew up like that. And even when I was still living at home, uh, and I was studying at the university, I always made a coffee at four o'clock. And my father, who was a dentist uh, two rooms away, he came and we all sat together and had coffee. So I don't know what we talked about, but that was just a, a ritual. And we always had our, our, and my husband and I also, we also have our meals together and talk a lot, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to. Take, first I take a, a cup of coffee and then I start talking. <laughs> I'm trying to connect it to the topic of, of boundaries. Is it when the Japanese, what you say, do they have too close boundaries that they don't let other people in anymore? And that in a family like we are used in Europe that we have at least for the people inside the family, a space in a circle where we have ritual, ritual meetings and exchanges, possibility. We give each other the possibility to for conversation by eating together. I think the Japanese, um, I mean, yeah, I think it, it, that's a good observation. I think I think it does have a lot to do with the culture that each each member of the family is involved in his or her own responsibilities. And um, the Japanese are not apt to sit around and sort of shoot the breeze anyway. It's not part of the social structure. And it's interesting that like the, the businessmen are forced to live in dormitories away from their families so that with the hope that they will bond. It's, it's the people are, are treated almost like 
um, machines in the sense that the the work the the working men have to live in these dormitories so that they can maximize their work time and then they're encouraged to go out every single night and drink heavily all these men together and so the bond so it's considered important that they bond but with the with the heavy consumption of alcohol of course it's a strange you know a strange kind of bonding that they're not um they they need to really drink a lot to let down their inhibitions and and communicate but the but within a family each person you know the child and the grandmother and the parents are all following their own trajectories like in parallel don't you think beatrice does that sound accurate you were in in, in Japan, you lived in Japan a long time, didn't you? So you know that. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder, we're talking about rituals and boundaries, and they seem almost diametrically opposed. But I wonder if like, you know, a ritual, which was maybe sitting down um, together for a meal on a consistent basis, or maybe part of the ritual is going out for a drink after a day of work, whatever it is. It's almost like uh, an agreed upon boundary or agreed upon role, or we're going to confine ourselves in this way, but it serves everybody. You know, the assumption is the ritual serves everybody who's participating in it. Um, but helps define, you know, it's a different way of defining a boundary for a family or work colleagues or something like that. Yeah, I had the idea collective boundary somehow, yeah, not like your that. own, but mm -hmm. group boundary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the group boundary, I just want that that just suddenly made me think of something that's that was very Japanese. Um, when we came back from Japan and moved back to California. Um, we were so nostalgic for Japan that we went to the San Diego Japanese Christian Church. And we went there for at least a year, I think. Um, and all Japanese people, <laughs> except for a few American men who had been, in, you know, veterans from the war who had married Japanese women when they were, you know, went over to Japan. Um, and poor little Beatrice, um, who, who of course loved Japan more than life itself, because it, it, she went to school, her first school was in Tokyo, um, was never, well, you should speak about Beatrice, but, but the, it, at some point we stopped going to that church because Beatrice said she felt excluded because um, it was a combination of, um, so apropos of the group boundary that you said, Heidi, it was a combination of um, the family boundaries and then the the general like Japanese American community boundary. And we didn't fit into either of those categories. Um, and a lot of the children were being homeschooled. It was a, you know, kind of a fundamentalist Christian church, but Jap Japanese style, a la Japonais. <laughs> um, and so Beatrice, who wanted to make friends, always felt like she was an outsider because she couldn't, she couldn't penetrate into any of those groups because she didn't fit the criteria. And um, so eventually we went to a different church. That's really interesting because when I was an actual outsider in Japan, I was totally included. So that's, that's, that's a kind of a fascinating thing. I guess it has to do with, with numbers, you know, I don't know, or something that it, 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 it was important for them here because there were a small group to exclude and, and form boundary of you know who was part of it and who wasn't but in Japan I was the only person that was different so they could just kind of adopt me in yeah you were novelty in Japan because you were solitary you were so you do, you weren't threatening their anyone's boundaries because if anything um you had to keep your own boundaries because <laughs> you were just like a the freak and everybody wanted to see what, who you were and what you were like. Whereas, yeah, in the in the in this in the Japanese Christian Church here, it was exactly that. It was they're a minority. They're the outsiders in the American culture, so they had to keep these impermeable boundaries. Not realizing that Beatrice, having lived in Japan and gone to school there, and coming voluntarily to that church, wanted to be included, but they but they couldn't somehow. You know, she couldn't crack open that shell 
of the, um, yeah, I think that's a good point. It's, it's the context where you are. Um, yeah. So boundaries help us function in a healthy way, right? I mean, I think when we use them well, they help us in our functioning. So because we protect ourselves from noxic, uh, toxic or noxious uh, interactions or people, um, but boundaries often can, you know, you're talking about they can also be inclusive, a boundary keeping things kind of intact and maybe helping us function that way. Um, in a family, it, it's hard. Again, it's a lot about roles of who's gonna do what and, and how available uh, are you uh, for the other people that you live with intimately. I remember when I was growing up, my, my good friend in, in childhood, she liked coming to our house because compared to her mother, my mother didn't impose herself a lot. I was the youngest child. I was the youngest of three. And I don't know if anybody has that experience of being the youngest. You're kind of like, they don't pay attention to you as much. <laughs> they just don't. They're done. <laughs> and my my friend was the oldest in her family and her mother was like on her like a hawk. And so she felt this tremendous relief coming to our house because she didn't have somebody kind, she didn't have a sense that she was being kind of, you know, supervised uh, that she did at her own house. So I always found that funny because I, I, to me, I felt like my parents were supervising me, but I could see, the difference. I could see the difference between, and I think it had a lot to do with our, our birth order. Um, yeah, and that, and that was interesting to, to have her talk about that. Made me appreciate my mother. <laughs> well, of this group, um, all of you have multiple siblings, right? Except for Beatrice. Oh, no? Oh, somebody thought you came from a big family, Monia. How many siblings? I'm an only child. My husband. Oh, you're an only child. Oh, of course. Now I remember. Of course. I, I can see what uh, Christine talked about was my grandchildren because they are three. And uh, it's exactly like that. The youngest one, she does it. Uh, she didn't want to be helped anywhere. And she, yeah, that was quite different and my mother my my daughter sort of gave up on her what she does she will do it all by herself so she was less supervised and yeah definitely so, so as an only child um then then you can um connect with Beatrice in terms of <laughs> well there's a term here that the the um the it's, it's kind of pejorative the helicopter mother who is constantly circling around, um, you know, ever, ever watching that the, you know, the child is doing the Do right thing. Do you feel that you are a helicopter mother? Did I feel like I was? No, I, um, I think I was, well, I don't know what I was. You tell me, Beatrice. I, I feel, I feel like uh, looking back, I, well, this is something I learned from, um, from therapy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> dialectical behavioral therapy. It's, it's my, it's my favorite thing that I've learned in therapy. Um, looking back, we all, everyone did the best they could at that time under the circumstances which presented themselves. So, um, so to look back with regret, um, it, that's why I love it so much to look back with regret is not, is not appropriate or realistic because, what we are now is not what we were then or the circumstance or whatever. Um, but there's always room for improvement, which I guess is what Beatrice and I need to work on now. Um, <laughs> um, but but I think that, yeah, I feel like I did, 
I really do feel like I did the best I could. I don't think I was a helicopter mother, but maybe Beatrice thinks otherwise. Um, I was just trying not to be a, a terrorist mother like my mother was. I My determination, even before I got pregnant, was if I ever have a child, I want to vow that I will not repeat the same mistakes that my mother did, I mean, made. Um, whether I succeeded or not, Beatrice will have to yeah, wait. Yeah, you have to say, Beatrice, your, your judgment, no. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to. But in our marriage, my husband was the helicopter mother. He really, uh, I was more, uh, yeah, more relaxed about it then. But he really, he tried, well, he was the son of a policeman and he knew what is lurking out there and he always tried to protect everybody from what evil and you have to fight for your rights every day. And uh, and I was more easygoing. So it, I had the easier part, but he was very, very strict and observant. Yeah. But now he gave up sort of. <laughs> Well, uh, Beatrice, you don't, if you don't want to answer, don't. But if you want to answer, go ahead. I don't know. I think it's tricky. I, you definitely were not like grandma. You succeeded in that, that front. <laughs> um, I think it was, an, it was strange. I, I felt it to be kind of a strange combination of very open and loving and supportive and then sometimes what felt like arbitrarily very strict and confined and and a little scary um so i don't know that that's that's i think that's how i would summarize growing up yeah and and again, it's it's talking to other people my age, right? You know that I think in many in many ways where their families, you know, were not supportive of what they wanted to do, especially creatively. I mean, that's that's a huge one. That's very. I I know so many people who would have loved to pursue music or dance or art things or you know get to explore different different you know, topics of, for careers or for whatever, I mean, even not even in the arts and anything. And I know a lot of people who have families who'd had a very clear agenda about what, what they were going to become and what was a real career and what, you know, was worth their time and would take away other things. And that's absolutely not my experience. My experience was a hundred percent. If I was interested in something, I could do it. Um, so, which then I don't know why I have such trouble doing the things that I'm interested in now. <laughs> I've, I've become society or some, some part of my brain that <laughs> took on that role because it wasn't, it wasn't from my family, or at least it wasn't from my mother and father. Maybe it was from my grandmother. Maybe it was from other parts of the family. Yeah, I think I think you pick up uh, those other messages from, like you said, what your friends were told from their families and all this, you know, what, how do we spend our time? What's a valuable way of spending our time? And that was a real gift you had to be able to make that decision on your own. But uh, yeah, I think we get a lot of messages just from our society in general, what's valued, you know, what's what's worthwhile. And it's obviously not uh you know it, it's not the correct way of doing things everybody should be able to decide that for themselves yeah you're looking back at my past i would have liked to to study music but a uh, singing you know but singing that's not something you study you you become a teacher or something that's worthwhile and so on so for me it's a gift if you have parents who are supporting you or not only parents, also friends or the, the, the environment, supporting you in what you really would like to do instead of telling you what you should need to want. You know? <laughs> and I had a lot of those who told me that's not right. And in my family, 
I was together with my sister who ended up in San Diego, no? and we were the, the crazy ones because we wanted to do other things than the, than they were were accepted in in society or in this let's say expectations of the class of my parents, which was not really high class. Not my my father was a school teacher, so it's sort of a middle middle class expectations and you you should do that you have to study something serious and then do a serious profession and so on I never succeeded doing this and not even my sister so by the others did the the, the boys did all three boys did became doctor or lawyers you know so yeah you are it's great. I have to give you a compliment to Victoria and congratulations to Beatrice. Heidi, I, I, this probably is not appropriate, but I'm so curious about your sister because she's like probably just down the road here. Is she, because um, just now when you were talking, I thought, oh, it would be interesting if she were on this call right now to s tell her story, but are you, you're, you're not, I mean, there's just not the same the connection I mean sorry I don't know what I'm saying I mean I know my sister wouldn't be on this call if her life depended on it so <laughs> so <laughs> no she she probably would be but she has not the same let's say orientation as we have uh yeah sort of a little bit in the integral consciousness some somehow I don't think she would she's more like uh you know like doing and a little bit. She has adopted the American way of speaking in an exaggerated way, <laughs> in, my, in my opinion. <laughs> but I mean, I don't know her so well. We, we see very rarely. I, I mean, I could invite her once and then we see how it's going. But I don't know how her <clears throat> conversation culture is, but I could I could propose it to her. She's in Lemon Grove. Uh, so. I know. She, that's literally... I was there this morning for for mass. <laughs> I go to mass uh, daily mass in Lemon Grove. Uh, so <laughs> you told me when she was in Lemon Grove. That's why I'm so curious because I I have the feeling like maybe I've even like passed her on the street and <laughs> not known that she was your sister. I can send uh, uh, you her her address when I came there to see her. All the front gardens of the house were full of flowers and things. And in her front garden was vegetables. You know, she's oh. always she's always doing the things a little bit different. <laughs> so I, I don't know if she still does it because her husband is working in uh, somewhere else quite far away. So sometimes she goes there. I don't know how far she is still doing the permaculture and things, but I sent you the address and then you can see if you find the house and find your vegetable <laughs> garden. If she's really that close here. by, could it be um, a coincidence? Do we believe in coincidences? No. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. She, is she on Zoom? What? On your Zoom? Sister. Yeah, we did on my website about three years ago, we started to do a conversation growing up in post-war Germany. We did three conversations and then it stopped, strangely. And she learned by, by being a guest of my uh, shows, she learned to do all this and she has a podcast, which is Sustainable Living Podcast or something. And she... Mm -hmm. she, she, she she was quite active in that. I don't know now. We we talk very little, actually. We, we The strange thing in our family, we were in five, but we have very little connection, very little exchange. So what's what's the age difference between you and your sister? Five years. She's, She's five, older? Younger. Older. Oh, younger. OK. Five yeah. years. Yeah, that's a significant amount. Yeah. But also, you know, my other brother is three years older than me. And we, yeah, sometimes we talk, but it's not really, it's not a heartfelt connection. Like I see you both, you know, that is nowhere in our family, such a connection, really not. It's a shame, but, you know, it was also a style of education to put one against the other in some way, you know, so. 
That's what it is. So maybe having grown up alone in that time is even better, Monia, than having learned war. I don't mind being an only child. Uh, I never had to fight my older sister or being dominated by my older sister. So it's uh, my two girls are, yeah, a good example. So you didn't have to establish boundaries with siblings, right? No. Siblings, siblings. I had to do it with my husband. <laughs> we had our sibling fights. It's, it's, yeah, you have to do it once. But I never really learned to um, uh, to fight. So um, it's not that I had to fight my husband, but uh, I once had to fight my lover. And uh, I noticed I, I have no means how to fight him or to fight for my own rights. or So I just always withdrew. So that was my way of, uh, yeah, of establishing boundaries. But this is the feminine way out. I mean, the female way out of the post-war, uh, at least post-war generation, I would Probably, say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, my husband is preparing my dinner, so I have to leave you. <laughs> yeah, I thank you very much. It was very interesting. And we meet in two weeks, and I can ask my sister if she wants to come. Yes, it would be interesting. It would be interesting. <laughs> okay. Do you look alike? Do you look alike? Not really. I, d I don't know. Uh, you will see. <laughs> okay. It will be great. Yeah, looking forward. Are we just before you go, Manya? Are we are we continuing with this time? Is is uh, but Gertrude and Hanali and and uh, Martini? Let us first close the recording and then we talk. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry.